Production funding for Sports Files is made possible in part by... Infinity of Memphis has moved to Germantown Road just half mile north of Wolf Chase Galleria and is proud to support WKNO for its quality broadcasting and service to our community. Quality and service? No wonder Infinity of Memphis feels at home on WKNO. The WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. My guest today on Sports Files is the Deputy Athletics Director at the University of Memphis, Mark Allnut. Once upon a time, Mark Allnut was a football player at the University of Missouri. He excelled on the field, and his future would be forged from what he did both on the gridiron and, more importantly, in the classroom. A love for college athletics would lead Mark down the administration path. He wants to be a difference maker in policy and in the lives of the student athlete. And so far, Allnut is making a difference. In fact, there are many that feel Mark is a budding superstar. After three-plus successful years serving Southeast Missouri State as the Red Hawks Athletics Director, Mark and his family made the trek down Interstate 55 and across the mighty Mississippi into Memphis. And while he's only been on the job for several months, Tigers AD Tom Bowen is singing the praises of his young deputy. Today, Mark Allnut on the challenges the University of Memphis Athletic Department faces as it moves forward during a time of tremendous change. Will the Tigers be ready for the next round of realignment? As most experts feel, it's not a matter of if, but when. Plus, the growth of Memphis football and the importance of getting hoops back on the right track. And it's all next on Sports Files. Mark, an absolute pleasure having you on the show. Greg, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Let's talk about, first of all, your responsibilities, Deputy Athletic Director, University of Memphis, what essentially are you doing? Well, it's, it's the number two position behind Tom Bowen. So when you look at a, a org chart, it's probably about the craziest thing I've seen. You have Dr. Rudd, the president, you have Tom Bowen, then you have myself, and then you have all the coaches and all the areas below us. So, you know, for me, it's an opportunity to, uh, you know, carry out the mission, the vision of, uh, of Tom and also of Dr. Rudd for athletics, but also to oversee, you know, key areas in our department. And a lot of it is external areas, fundraising, you know, the marketing aspect of it, uh, media relations, but then also the same token, looking at some of those uh, internal areas as well. When we talk about internal areas, whether it's game operations, for mm -hmm. example, but also some sports. Tom and I will work together with working with uh, Coach Fuente from football issues and things like that. We'll work together working with Coach Pastner from a basketball standpoint. But, uh, you know, the two sports that I'll work directly with will be with uh, Coach McFerrin for women's basketball and, uh, and Coach Rock for, uh, for baseball. So I'm definitely excited to, uh, to be here and begin the relationships with those, with those folks. The buck stopped with you at Southeast Missouri State three-plus years as their athletics director. You had plenty of success. What can you take from that job into this job? Well, you take plenty. I mean, anytime you have an opportunity to, to sit in the chair in, in our business, that's what that's what it's called. You know, you learn a lot. You know, obviously you, you accomplish a lot of things as well. But but really the, the one thing that I take back of my experience at Southeast Missouri State University, which I didn't have the university, is that direct relationship with the, with the president. So understanding, you know, the dynamic of that, understanding, you know, where, where the president can obviously assist and help you know, athletics, understanding the key people outside of the president, that is, that is, that is very important, like the, the Board of Regents right. that they had at, uh, at Southeast Missouri State University, but also other vice presidents and things like that. You know, who are some of those people that you can touch sometimes on a daily, sometimes on a weekly basis, basis to be able to help uh, us continue to advance what we're doing in athletics? Tom is always praising you. He's ecstatic about being able to get you from Southeast Missouri State to come to Memphis. I've read articles where they call you a, a budding star in the industry. <laughs> when you hear something like that, I'm sure it's flattering, but what do you think about well, it? Well, yeah, it is flattering. It probably goes back to when people say that the first time I met them, I probably gave them 20 bucks, <laughs> you know, for them to continue to say good things, you know, about me. But, but I tell you what, you know, a lot of that is, 
you know, again, the work that uh, we, I'm not an I person, we, we were able to do at the University of Missouri, where I got a lot of my background from, of working with uh, Gary Pinkle, the head football coach, and then the former athletic director there, uh, Mike Alden, when I was part of his team, and then going to Southeast Missouri State University and being able to do things there to, again, kind of raise the bar there at that, at that department, you know, when it comes to winning nine championships in three years, uh, increasing the academic prowess of our student athletes there, community service, to, which was almost non-existent at the, my last year there, you know, spending 4,000 hours giving back to the community. So it's those sort of things that you get, you know, notice, but also more importantly, it's, it's the network. You know, being able to maintain those relationships out there, and, and when people say that, I'm flattered, but I'm also, like I said, I'm not an eye guy. It, it takes a good team of people to surround yourself with to be able to be put in that position. As you mentioned, you worked with Pinkle, but you played at Missouri, not under Coach Pinkle, but you did play under a different regime. What can you take or what did you take from being a player, being a student athlete into this position now where you deal with student athletes? Well, I'll tell you, that, that's why I'm in it. It's the experience that, that I had being a student athlete. And, and I say that because as a student athlete, you really don't know the how, like how things work. I mean, heck, you know not to be late to meetings. Right. <laughs> you, you know right. not to be late to practice. You know you're going to go to, you know, University of Kansas to win a football game. So you, you know the wins, you know the wheres, you know the what you're going to do, but it's a how. And, and for me, when I started my career early on as a graduate assistant, I worked with our director of football operations at the time and just learned all those nuances in, in terms of how things, are, how things work, how things are put together, how does travel work. You know, what's this component of a scholarship check? I mean, how's all that ticketing, marketing, development, fundraising? So for me, understanding that aspect, but then also taking a step back, me being a former student athlete and understanding that, you know, these, these young men and women, you know, I, I've been in their footsteps. You know, I know what some of the challenges are. I know what the excitement is. And, and it just puts me in a great position, my family and I, to be able to model that behavior to student athletes. Hey, the, this family unit. You know, this is this is how we do things. I mean, this is going to help prepare you for life after sports. So, I mean, all that you know surrounds me being a being a student athlete, the experiences that I had, and and I tell you what, there's a little bridge here. Uh, you know, Ricky Hunley. There is. Was, yeah, Ricky Hunley, who's a defensive line coach here. He was a defensive line coach at the University of Missouri. Now I might look like a defensive lineman now, but back in the day I was kind of a, <laughs> a slimmer linebacker. But but again, kind of reconnecting with folks like that and understanding the passion that he had in terms of teaching in terms of developing uh, young men. It's, it's something special. I wish we were able to make it a one-way bridge so Barry Odom didn't go that way to Missouri, <laughs> but, but those things happen. Mark, I'm sure you're asked this question a lot. You haven't been in Memphis a long time, but I'm sure people come up to you and say, what about the future? How do we get into a Power 5 conference? I would imagine there's going to be future realignment. There's going to be uh, movement down the road. We don't know when, but I think we know it will happen. Is Memphis in position to be one of those schools that are asked to come to one of those conferences? Even if it's five, maybe it'll be four, maybe it'll be six. Who knows what the landscape will be? But sure. is Memphis in that position? Well, well, first of all, I mean, it's, it's as you mentioned, Greg, I mean, it, it's not going to stop. I mean, it, it's going to be a, another wave of realignment that's going to happen. And, and the best thing you can say, and the, the key word there is position. Mm -hmm. You know, what can we do to position ourselves and make ourselves, you know, attractive to whenever movement happens, whether it's a Big 12, ACC, Pac-12, whatever the case might be, you know we have to be in firm footing here to to be attractive to these to these conferences. We can't just sit back and say, "Hey, we're the University of Memphis, you should take us." Okay, so what are some things that, that are occurring right now? Which you know what it shows the commitment that not only the department has, but the university, but also more importantly, this community has to be able to position us, ourselves for that move. So. We'll probably talk about this a little bit later, but the Time to Shine you know, campaign, a, a school of our size to be able to come out publicly and announce a, a $40 million capital campaign that is to enhance football with the indoor you know, football facility and other programming around that, but then also a, a new basketball practice facility. And for us to be able to announce that, you know what, we're about 60% complete. Okay. You know, after, you know, it hasn't even been two years that this first came out and, and about. So, you know, that shows a commitment out there. You know, the other commitment is, you know, how, how people now are, are, are buying into to our football program. Football is very important. I mean, if you go back to realignment, uh, you know, a couple of years ago, you're not seeing a school like, in no disrespect to a school like the University of Kansas, 
who has a strong basketball program, but the football program was not where it needed to be at that at that time. So you know, for us to have a, an outstanding coach and coaching staff and and the and the job that they're doing, I mean, this has also become more attractive. And also too, when you have a program like that, and, and now you go back to our Thursday night game in Cincinnati where we had you know over 45,000 people there. You know, this this old Miss game is going to be phenomenal. And it's going to be unlike, you know, games in the past where Ole Miss might have come here or Tennessee might have come here when you look at the stadium and you saw a lot of colors of the other team. Exactly. And not, and not people supporting us. So, you know, for us to, to position ourselves is for us to, again, show that commitment that, you know, we're continuing to build, you know, this program, uh, not just with bricks and mortar, but also through, uh, you know, commitments for externally commitments from the university, you know, hiring talented people, you know, our, our coaches, our, our staff, you know, people take notice of that. And, and, and the, I think the second thing is you just go back to the community. It's a prideful community. You know, there's, there's a lot of support out there for us. And there's a lot of support out there that could, could help us, you know, when that time comes to show a conference that, you know, it, University of Memphis is committed to being at this level. You answered a bunch of, the, bunch of the questions, but we know that the groundbreaking has already taken place for the basketball facilities on the Park Avenue campus. You said 60% complete with the capital campaign. What will it take for the groundbreaking to begin for the football, the indoor football facilities? Will it have to be 100% or is there going to be well, something no, soon? No, there, there's going to be something soon. On a, you know, we had a ceremonial groundbreaking uh, with, with basketball. That was the, uh, the Friday after Cincinnati game, and, and we're finalizing a ceremonial groundbreaking for football uh, later this month is what we're trying to trying to be able to get that done you know obviously from a, a construction standpoint it's going to depend on the money raised now since that launch of that uh, public phase I mean you can add about another four million dollars that that we have right now in mm -hmm. commitments and pledges from people who are stepping up and, and help support us so you know that 24 million right now is over 28 million which is which is a good thing and there's a lot of things that are that are being put in place now that that number is going to be able to skyrocket. So for us, we're we're on par right now in terms of being able to have a football groundbreaking. And also at the end of the day, what we're committed to is having both facilities substantially complete. Our student athletes, our coaches, you know, enjoying these new facilities by the start of the uh, 2017 uh, academic year. So we've basically done a 180 with football and basketball. Uh, football now is as good as it's been. And we certainly hope, and you certainly hope, that that will continue. Basketball had a off year. 18 and 14 for a lot of programs is very <laughs> respectable. For the University of Memphis, it's not. Is there pressure on Josh this year? Well, you know, I, I think it's pressure on everybody, you know, this year. And, and, and for us, it's understanding first and foremost, you know, the, the pride that's there in this community for basketball, the rich tradition, you know, the, the history. And like you mentioned, 18 wins. You know, I, I go back to when I was at Southeast Missouri State University. Our coach wins 18 years. I gave him a contract extension, <laughs> you know. And, right. and then for here, right. you know, you don't make the tournament. So, mm -hmm. you know, I, I feel that, you know, obviously, you know, going into this year, there's going to be a lot of people that are, you know what, and rightfully so, m might have been disappointed for, uh, for what happened, you know, past year not making the tournament. And, you know, for us, it's an opportunity to – to be able to come out and, and have a, a fast start to the season, a strong start to the season, and try to win those people back. You know, I'm very confident that, uh, you know, we have a, a great coach in place. I feel that, you know, our student athletes that, that we have in this program right now, I mean, they're, they're excited, they're committed to the season. And, you know, hopefully for us, you know, obviously, you know, it, what happens takes place and in between the, the, those painted lines on the court or like the football field that, you know, we can be able to come together and be – like what we have been in the past. And I'm very confident that's going to happen. So pressure, yeah, there, there, there's pressure on, on everybody, you know, not just basketball. Heck, right. there's, there's pressure on, on, on Justin. There's pressure on, uh, you know, whether it's women's basketball, baseball, whatever the case is. But we also understand, you know, how important, you know, basketball is. And, and a lot, the thing that I like about this is, you know, it, it reminds me a little bit about, you know, when I was at my previous institution, University of Missouri, how, you know, that momentum with football was, was building up, was building. And, and I remember there was one year, it was a magical year where football ended up going to the Cotton Bowl. You know, they had, they were ranked number one, you know, in, in, in that year, but that momentum definitely caught on with the rest of the department. It was like one of our strongest years. And, and for us to do something very similar like that here at the University of uh, Memphis would be phenomenal. I'm going to need you for another show because we have so many issues we haven't even touched. I got less than a minute before we wrap it up with five for the road, but 
How would you say the cost of attendance has been handled? Is, is everything okay? Because that's a financial commitment. Yeah, th it is. It is. It, but, you know, here's the thing. Commitment. You know, commitment from, that's private dollars. You know, that's not, that's not tax dollars. That's not from the university. Those are people that understand the commitment through our Tiger Scholarship Fund to be able to do what's right. And also from a competitive standpoint, you know, it becomes a competitive advantage, competitive disadvantage when it comes to recruiting. You know, if we're not able to offer uh, what they're offering at Cincinnati, what they're offering at Tulsa, you know, you, you name the schools that we're competing with, then we're going to be a step behind. So how we phase this in, I think, was idea. You know, obviously with men's and women's basketball, with our women's uh, uh, sports as well, and then also with football. And then next year, all of our sports are going to be in a position to have full cost of attendance. So that's, that's phenomenal. And, again, that's the commitment based on mm -hmm. people who are supporters right. of this program. Mark, you're off the hot seat, but you're not done the interview just yet. We, <laughs> we wrap up every show with something we call Five for the Row. We want our viewers to learn a little bit more about our guests. So it's five simple questions. First thing that comes to mind. Ready? Let's go. Favorite professional sports team, any sport? Uh, Kansas City Royals, Kansas City Chiefs. I can't, I can't you, decide you can't between the two. Distinguish between the two? I, but we, Kansas City Royals, baseball season. Okay, you're going Royals. Yep. Favorite pro athlete of all time? Derek Thomas. Oh, what a great one. Former Alabama star. Mm -hmm. Passed away way too soon. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's talk music. What do you like? What do you listen to? Give me a genre, maybe a, a group, a rapper, a, a singer. What do, you, what do you listen to? You know, I have a, a, I like listening to old school stations. Like, so anything in the 90s, whether it's, it's rap, it's hip hop, it can be alternative, it can be anything, but just that 90s genre. Did you hear what he said? Did you hear what he said? Old, there was old school 90s. There was 90s stations. Oh, my gosh, do I feel old here. Um, favorite movie of all time? A Shawshank Redemption. Great one. Great pick. Favorite TV show? Modern Family. Modern Family. How about a current one? What would it be? Modern Family would be current. Modern okay. Family's current. Oh, Modern, modern Family. Modern Family, modern family is, is current. If I had to go to the past, oh my goodness, I, you know I would have to go. Of, you know what I was thinking? What, what Mama's thinking? family. No, no, modern family, <laughs> modern you? family. Gosh, if I have to go back uh, of all time, I have to go to the Cosby Show. The Cosby Show. Yep. Mark the 17th, Ole Miss, 11 a.m. kickoff, ABC Network. And we got to remind everybody get there early. If you get try there. to get there 15 minutes before the game, you're going to get caught in a traffic yeah, jam, yeah, right? Please, please get there early. And I appreciate you bringing that up. You know, we have Tiger Walk. It's a tradition that, uh, you know, our team gets off the buses, walks past the fountain on, on Tiger Lane there. What time? That starts about 8.30. So I want all of our fans there at 8.30. See that. Enjoy the tailgating. Start getting in the stadium. And let's watch a, a, a great game against Ole Miss. It's going to be quite a day. Mark, thank you so much. Great, great appreciate stuff. It. We thank appreciate you. it. That's Mark Allnut. He's the Deputy Athletics Director at the University of Memphis. We'll take a break. Overtime is coming up next. In one form or another, since the dawn of time, humans have raced against each other. It's the competitive nature of man, from ancient Roman chariot racing to car racing to the 100-yard dash. And during that time, men have pitted beasts against one another, although we truly don't know if they're competitive in nature. Horse racing is the sport of kings. Greyhound racing takes place all around the country, including right here in the Mid-South. And there's even hamster racing. Well, after some crack research from our Sports Files investigative team, we have discovered, brace for it, pig racing. Yes, the swine kind, with names like Lindsay Loham, Squilly Nelson, and Snoop Hoggy Hog. Show Me Swine Racers from East Prairie, Missouri, recently paid a visit to the Mid-South Fair in South Haven, Mississippi. And what transpired was, well, you be the judge. One footnote. No pig, hog, or piglet were injured during the videotaping of this segment. But after the races concluded, there was a delicious breakfast feast for everyone. Just kidding. Check it out. James, we're here at the Mid-South Fair, and you've got swine racing going on. Tell us about what swine racing is. That's three different heats of pigs, four pigs in each set, racing for iced oatmeal cookies. And how long have uh, you been doing this? About 20 years. 
from the west coast to the east coast, all over the United States. Everybody loves it everywhere. So tell us about the pigs. We got some Yorkshire, Hampshire mixes, and we got some regular Hampshires, and we got some three to 400 pound pot bellies. So these aren't little pigs, are they? Not the pot bellies, no. They're about my size. Our first set of pigs are Hampshires. They come out, they're a little bit smaller pig, and they race each other. Whoever wins gets a bunch of iced oatmeal cookies. Our second set are some Hampshire, Yorkshire mixes. They're a little bit bigger, a little bit faster. Race for a bunch of cookies. The pot bellies, they're our fastest pigs we do have with us. Once they get going, it's hard to get them stopped. So do you ever mix them up? No, they, they'll fight each other if you mix them up. So who's the favorite out here? Say in the first group, the Hampshire. Squilly Nelson. Uh, who else you got in that race? Uh, we got Squilly Ray Cyrus, Hammond Montana, and Tammy Swinette. And in the uh, second one, that's the mixed breed? Yes. Okay, who's in that one? Arnold Schwarzenegger, Hammy Faye Bacon, David Letterham, and uh, Lindsay Loham. And then the pot bellies? It's Snoop Hoggy Hogs, number one. Not Wanna Race is number two. Number three is Shaken Bacon, and number four is Taylor Not So Swift. What kind of reaction do you get with uh, from the people that come out and watch? All kinds of reactions. Facial expressions, noise, clapping, all kinds of stuff. Is there any uh, paramutual betting going on? Not, not between us. Maybe between the audience, but not between us. Do you have a favorite? Do I have a favorite? Uh, I'd have to say Hammond, Montana. And how did you get started? Um, I started out with uh, my friend uh, back with the pet, with the petting zoo, exotic animals, and he just branched out from petting zoo, pony rides, and pig races. What kind of special training do these pigs get? Um, we use uh, ice oatmeal cookies. <laughs> it takes about four days to get them to run. You put cookies in the starting gate, um, back around to a feed pan when they come back around, and then back in the, the trailer. The pigs are really smart. But kind of like the Olympic training. Right. <laughs> Since we got some older and bigger pigs, we're going to pick out some older and bigger pig breeders. Yes, this is going to be an adult race. So kids and adults, what you got to do is you got to pick out. Your mom's dad, giant chocolate brother, sister, wife, son, boyfriends, girlfriends, nieces, nephews, grandmas, grandpas, cousins, friends, people you don't like. I think I'm, I'm blind, Hambone. I think, I think I just threw up in my mouth a little bit. Put your shirt up! Nobody wants to see your undercarriage. Oh man. Most definitely don't look like he's ever pushed away from a dinner table yet. You, you got a good cook? What time should we show up for dinner? The lady back there in the black shirt, we're gonna give her number three. She's hanging it up trying to get a pig root for her out there. I need mean, one more. What are you doing? You're about half starved to death. And you're cheating. I tell you what, it was number four, cheater. Running! I'm gonna start getting to the Pick your pig. Uh, actually, uh, well, I guess he asked for the rather large people, so I just gave him a little flash of this right here, showed him the goods, and the rest is pretty much history. Do you, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. I, I was just say well, he had double goods, so therefore we got number one. Hey, Brian, I see you're parked right next to, real close to the uh, swine races. Did you ever uh, make them an offer on the losers? <laughs> no. I don't.
And now, uh, race horses, when they finish racing and stuff, they get put out to stud. What about these guys? We sell them at auction. We don't ask what happens to them. You get attached to them. Like family. Not exactly sure why I have a hankering for bacon, but I, I certainly do. Hey, the Grizzlies preseason schedule is underway with a couple of games played earlier in the week at FedEx Forum. The Grizz hosted the Houston Rockets on Tuesday and Maccabi Haifa from Israel on Thursday. The Grizzlies have the bulk of their team back, including their core four of Marcus Gasol, Mike Conley, Zach Randolph, and Tony Allen. They have added big man Brandon Wright and wing Matt Barnes, and now have Jeff Green for a full offseason and training camp. Head coach Dave Yeager will have plenty of options this season, as the Grizzlies are the deepest they have ever been in their franchise history, and that includes all 15 seasons in Memphis. The regular season opener is set for Wednesday, October 28th versus LeBron James and the defending Eastern Conference champion, Cleveland Cavaliers. And that'll do it for us. Remember, you can see any of our previous Sports Files programs by heading to our website at WKNO.org or checking us out on YouTube. Have a great week, and we'll see you next time. Production funding for Sports Files is made possible in part by... Infinity of Memphis has moved to Germantown Road just half mile north of Wolf Chase Galleria and is proud to support WKNO for its quality broadcasting and service to our community. Quality and service? No wonder Infinity of Memphis feels at home on WKNO.